heart that hurts I want to spend my life Mending broken people I want to spend my life Mending broken people And welcome to 3ABN Today Live. We are so happy to be with you this evening. I have my co-host, my son, Jason Bradley. <laughs> Good to be here with Yay, you too. Jason. <laughs> Jason is the general manager of 3ABN's Dare to Dream Network, and he's doing an outstanding job. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. <laughs> Praise <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> we often say the same things at, at the, the same, same time. time with the same uh -huh. tone. It's a little scary. But anyway, <laughs> we are so happy that you have taken the time out to join us this evening because we have a program that is going to be so helpful to you, so enlightening, so informative, and just a blessing. So are you excited about this program? I'm excited. You I can't are? wait to hear all these wonderful testimonies. I know, me too, mm -hmm. me too. And so before we introduce our guests, let's go to the music for the evening and then we'll introduce the guests. So we're going to keep you on pins and needles for a few minutes. Our music is coming from Message of Mercy and it's Whispers to Your Heart. Shelter 
How lovely. Mm -hmm. That was lovely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate Message of Mercy. Thank you for being with us. All right, Jay, yeah. we have special guests with us this evening. We do. We do. Dr. Neil Nedley is with us. And I've told Dr. Nedley that he is one of my lifestyle medicine heroes. Um, years ago, I, I bought Proof Positive. Okay. And it is just an outstanding book. So welcome, Dr. Nedley. Thank you. <laughs> We're so glad. And with you, we have Kelly Green. And yes. Kelly is going to share her testimony. And we have some other guests as well that are going to be on in the latter part of the program. So you're not going to want to miss any of this program tonight. So Dr. Nedley, tell us what you've been doing recently. What have, what have you been, what is this program about? Well, really the program is about health of our brain. Okay. And uh, we do conduct uh, depression and anxiety recovery programs and optimize your brain programs mm. and enhancing IQ and also EQ, emotional intelligence. But we're probably mostly known at least over the last 15 years and our emphasis on mental health, anxiety disorders, depression, all forms of anxiety and depression. Uh, as well as things that are related to that, like obsessive compulsive disorder mm. or post-traumatic stress disorder or, you know, phobias or panic disorder or those sorts of things, bipolar depression um, as well. And so we have uh, outpatient programs and also residential programs where we take the more significant um, conditions and people and they actually live with us for 10 days or more uh, to actually optimize their brain and eradicate their depression and anxiety. That's the goal. Now, you know, I notice that just in conversations that there's so much, it seems to me, so much more, um, there's so much more incidences of these disorders whether it's depression or anxiety or panic or OCD. I mean, I just, I see a lot of it as I talk to people. So how, how is it changing over the years? Like, is there actually more of an incidence of, of those disorders than previously? Much more. It's actually being reported in the scientific literature that utilizing the same criteria for diagnosis, the rates of depression and anxiety have skyrocketed. And, uh, you know, I'm also a college president at, at Weimar, and I go to continuing education with other college presidents. The number one reason why college presidents lose sleep now mm. is the mental health of their students. Mm. Because 60% of them actually have a diagnosable mental illness. 60% uh, of college now. students? You know, and when I was going to college, it was like 5%. And so it is the majority of them are having significant mental health challenges. What would you say is the, the cause of the increase? Well, the cause is uh, multiple causes, but one of the big causes is actually the addictions to screens and iPhones oh. and huh. things of that nature. Huh. People are not relating to society so much, yeah. you know, in regular social interactions like we're having here. Right, <laughs> right, uh, yes. right. They are doing it off of a screen, which is kind of a false social uh, mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a real social experience. And then they are also driven to distraction with these devices. Mm -hmm. And so they get on their device to do something useful, but within five minutes, they're no longer doing anything useful. They mm. got a push notification, they got a Snapchat, uh, they got a news notification, and they just uh, go off. And of course, the, the people that are in charge of the internet and, mm -hmm. uh, and the ones who are really trying to capitalize on this, try to find out what it is that all of us like. Mm -hmm. And so we're in there trying to do something useful and then there's this little notification about something that we're interested in that all of a sudden passes the screen and now our mind is away from that area. Mm. And the area of our brain that requires focus attention 
is identical to the area of our brain that manages distressing emotions. Mm. Wow. And so if we can't focus, we're not going to be able to manage our emotions. And huh. so this area of the brain is actually shrinking in people because they're constantly shifting their attention and they're not able to actually focus on something for so, more than 10 minutes. So it's an excess level of stimuli. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating to me on so many different levels because first of all, you have the screen addiction mm -hmm. where, you know, young people are just always on their screens. Yes. And not, not just young people, I mean, sometimes my husband will say to me, did you get distracted? Because I'll, I'll start out doing one thing <laughs> and, then I'll, and then I'll get distracted to do another. So I know what you're talking about, but I didn't know that it is a cause of mental illness. Yes. I mean, you this know, is really, you know, maybe that's what's wrong with you, me. You know, when, no, just teasing. when Steve Jobs <laughs> came out with these <laughs> devices, of course, he limited his own kids uh -huh. and their access to them because mm. he recognized there could be complications. No. <laughs> but, you know, we only looked at the benefits. We didn't look at the risks. Right. And, you know, imagine a drug company coming out with a drug that only looked at the benefits but not the risks. Mm. We would talk about how greedy they are and how unethical and all mm -hmm. of this, but this is what happened with the devices. And we were so gullible, humanity, to say that, you know, every child should have one of these. And, you know, there should be no school left behind. And we thought that we were going to enter into a whole new sphere of positive education. Mm. But it turns out the opposite has occurred. Mm. The way our devices are normally utilized is actually impairing our brains mm. and actually impairing our ability to even manage our emotions or even remember things. You know, that's the other thing. Digital dementia. We're seeing memories at an all-time low. Digital yeah. dementia. Digital dementia, mm. yeah. It's wow. diagnosed in people in their 20s and 30s. They just can't remember things. I had no idea that this was so ubiquitous for one thing and that that it's affecting our young people uh -huh. at this huge rate. I'm I'm back on the 60%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I, yeah. that's just appalling to me. It really makes sense though when you think about it. I mean because technology you think that it's going to enhance things but it, it really cripples you in mm. the sense that you don't have to remember anybody's n number their That's phone true. number or anything mm -hmm. you know you can ask these smart devices you can just talk to it and it'll pull up whatever you need exactly <laughs> you know so yeah that's that's interesting yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so this is one of the obvious reasons because, you know, the iPhone came out in 2007. And so in the last 12 years, we've seen this exponential growth in mental illness and all time lows in emotional intelligence. It's the most mm -hmm. gullible generation as well. They don't have facts stocked in their head. And so when someone comes up with something, in yesteryear, we recognized if this is true and if that's true, then this cannot be true. Mm. But with this generation, since they don't have any real truths that are solidified mm -hmm. in their brain, uh, when someone comes up with something that's pretty far out there and it seems attractive, they'll actually start going that direction. And it's kind of almost ludicrous for a previous generation to go that way. Uh, and so uh, this is why, you know, the whole gullibility crisis and fake news has become a big thing because we are more gullible. Before, you know, uh, the World War II generation never would have been, you know, fake news would have gone nowhere with them mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. because they had facts stocked in their head. They, had, they recognized, uh, you know, what was true and what wasn't much more readily. But this present generation also not being very social because they tend to utilize their devices in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, are more gullible and they're also much more anxious when it comes to real live social interactions because that's too much for them. You know, there's a lot that goes on in regular social interactions. There's facial countenance and there's mm -hmm. all the different aspects and they get a little fear, fearful of that. And mm -hmm. so they don't really like to go out in public as much. And of course, isolation is, will lead to significant sadness yes. you know, it's, the, it's the you know the uh, 
uh, punishment that is the most severe punishment we can give a prisoner is solitary confinement. That's but right. Many of our, of our kids today are solitarily confined to four walls with their device. Hmm. And uh, mm. they don't recognize that it's actually having some of the similar effects to their brain that regular solitary confinement would be because this is not a real person we're interacting with. Mm. But they treat it in a much more treasurable manner than they do their own brother or sister or father or mother, mm. you know? Oh, uh, yes. If the brother or sister leaves, no big deal. But you take my device, whoa. Ooh, there's some <laughs> major separation uh -huh. anxiety mm. that goes on with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For but sure. I think you're also dealing with a false sense of reality because when you go to Instagram and Facebook and some of these other social media sites, people are painting the best picture of themselves mm. and showing you all of these things um, that, you know, they don't show you their struggles. They don't show you That's uh, right. depression and the things that they're dealing with. It's a very false world. Mm -hmm. yes. And we're only seeing one little glimpse and aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, even the Bible said to compare ourselves among ourselves is not wise. And that's what social media does. We're attracted to it because we can connect. Mm -hmm. But it turns out after we connect, we end up comparing much more than we're connecting. Mm -hmm. and comparing ourselves among ourselves, particularly when they see 2%, you know, I can tell you most of society today that reveres Hollywood stars mm -hmm. or reveres whoever they're revering and thinking that they're great people, mm -hmm. if they actually saw what their daily lives would be, they wouldn't be a bit envious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> because they're projecting this true. falsehood, you know, yep. that is very uh, in true. regards to them. And so they think, boy, why isn't my life like this? Why am I not doing this and that? And it's kind of like, you know, you're only seeing less than 1% of that person's <laughs> life. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, if they could see a typical Christian's life who's in the Lord, they would get so much more attracted to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the devil doesn't want them to see all of that. That's right. They just want them to they want them to see that one percent of someone who will suck them into something that's a deception mm -hmm. and will end up ruining them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Kelly, you've just been sitting here, so <laughs> <laughs> you have a very fascinating story. Uh, Dr. Nedley, would you just kind of give us some background? Sure. Well, you talked about reasons for increased mental illness. It's not just devices, but also the use of substances mm -hmm. has increased. Mm -hmm. And in the last three years, longevity is remarkably decreasing in the United States. This is the first time since World War I, when mm -hmm. the flu epidemic and a world war was going on, that longevity has decreased. So that's back all the way from 1916. And this next year, they think it's gonna go down some more. Mm. Why is it going down? It's not because cancer is increasing and heart disease. Those are things that were on the rise before, but it's actually due to what's called deaths of despair. Mm. Deaths of despair, we are seeing a marked increase in alcohol-related deaths, mm -hmm. a marked increase in opioid related deaths and drug overdoses and a marked increase in suicide. Mm. And suicide has actually been increasing even when the economy is going up, mm. which has not happened before. When you take a look at the history, normally when the economy goes up, suicide rates go down. Economy goes down, suicide rates go up. Um, you know, not long ago we had the best economy from the 1950s or 60s. And, but yet suicide rates are higher. So mm. what's gonna happen when the economy goes down again, you know it's going to get even worse. Mm. And so um, Kelly actually um, uh, emulates uh, a, a, in a many ways the typical person in America today that's had some struggles. She grew up with some struggles and it led her into substances. Mm -hmm. All three of those deaths of despair aspect mm -hmm. were knocking on her door. Mm. And uh, one right after another and now she has totally overcome Praise and God. has a fulfilled and happy existence. Oh. Uh, and so, uh, Kelly, you might just mention, what was your childhood like uh, and, and what might have led you into some of these things? Uh, well, my parents were divorced when I was two mm. and then um, both of my parents remarried and, um, but it was, you know, still a split home 
and I, I lived with my mother and my stepfather. Um, and that household, um, they did the best they could. Um, it was a very violent uh, household, uh, physically and verbally. Mm. So. And so you were watching, you saw all that. I saw a lot, I experienced a lot. Um, I also played a part in it. Um, so I was exposed to bad behavior, um, you know, fairly young. And it shaped me um, into a very fearful and timid, um, and easily swayed. I was just searching for, I guess, love mm -hmm. and acceptance. Mm -hmm. What were your teenage years like? Um, I did very uh, poor in school. Mm -hmm. um, I had a core group of friends that were actually a good influence on me, um, but then I also had another group of friends that I could do what I wanted with, and they didn't care about me. Um, so I was very confused as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any direction, mm -hmm. and I didn't have, um, I didn't trust any adults. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned uh, to me even today, um, at age 10, you started with substances. <laughs> mm, yes, I found, well, I was with some girlfriends of mine and we stole our parents' cigarettes and we smoked cigarettes at 10 years at 10. old. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So that kind of opened the door to a new pattern mm -hmm. of behavior, yes. right? And so you started with tobacco, I guess, at 10. But was this just like a, a an isolated incident or was or did this begin a pattern? Oh, this began a pattern. Mm -hmm. It was like the gates opened. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, looking back, I can see how um, really the devil just mm -hmm. took, took a hold yeah. and did not let me go. Mm -hmm. So after tobacco, what was it then? Tobacco, and then it was alcohol at 15. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, it was marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, and then I stayed in between marijuana, uh, alcohol, and tobacco for years. Mm -hmm. Did your parents have any idea as to what was going on? They knew about the cigarettes. They could smell it, um, but they never, I mean, my mom said, you know, you shouldn't smoke, but it wasn't, it was very odd. They, they punished me for really ridiculous things, but they wouldn't, they didn't punish me for smoking cigarettes or stealing their alcohol. Mm. Mm. So, so they knew you were drinking too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they knew. Mm -hmm. Do you think that having two sets of friends kind of caused a double-minded? Definitely. Situation? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I was basically halfway in and halfway out. Yeah. What was the spiritual climate in your home at that time? Um, or was there any kind of spirituality at all? There wasn't. We weren't, we, we, I mean, we might have gone to church um, a couple Sabbaths mm -hmm. uh, growing up. My grandparents really played that role um, in my life, and um, they were the one, they, are the ones responsible for um, bringing me back to the Lord. Ah, Honestly. we want to hear about that. I have a couple more questions though before we get to sure. turn around. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how did you get into, um, after, you, after you dealt with the marijuana, did you go into anything heavier and what was that? Yeah, I, I stayed with marijuana for years and then, um, I ended up pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, I was six months pregnant and I got a kidney stone. Oh. And I was working for, um, f for physicians and uh, they admitted me into the, the hospital and they thought they were doing the right thing. 
uh, for me, but that's when I was introduced because of the pain. I was put on a PCA pump of Dilaudid mm. and then given oral Percocet, and that was for a week straight. Mm. And um, it that that really opened the floodgates. That medication, um, I believe, is just pure evil. Mm. There's nothing really beneficial, and with that amount of pain, there's not a narcotic strong enough mm. to take away the pain. Yeah. So it really was, it just didn't do any good. So I cultivated a, a new habit. Right. A new drug of choice. I was already, I already had the addictive behavior mm -hmm. from the cigarettes. Mm -hmm. right. I just didn't know. I couldn't recognize it. Yeah. Right. It's so interesting to me how Satan it just, he doesn't do everything all at once. Mm -hmm. So he gives you a little bit here, started yeah. you with the cigarettes, right. then takes you into the alcohol and the marijuana, then takes you into the opioids. Then, I mean, everything, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, you know, there's a strategy. He has a strategy, just like God has strategy. Mm -hmm. The enemy has strategy. And his, mm -hmm. his whole thing is to destroy, mm -hmm. to yeah. take us on this downward spiral and destroy us. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just amazing to me how, how he works. And you, and you can see it over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. His plan is to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And God has a better plan. Amen. He has a better plan. So how long were you involved in, in this whole downward spiral? Um, it didn't take long. Um, probably five years I was addicted to opiates. Mm -hmm. Five years. Mm -hmm. wow. And how bad was your habit? Um, it, the last year of me using, I was taking a ridiculous amount. It was up to 300 milligrams in a 24 hour. Wow. Of pure Oxycontin. Ooh. And so how are you Oxycontin getting Oxycontin normally 20 milligrams is enough to last a long time. It'll just put someone who's not used to narcotics mm -hmm. in a stupor mm -hmm. and just want to sleep. And so Oxycontin is a potent yes. um, narcotic. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she was on 300 milligrams wow. a day. Wow. Yeah. And I know that wasn't cheap either. So no. How much? Yeah, that's. I am so embarrassed to even say it. And I kind of don't want to because yeah. at this point I feel like I need to protect yeah. some of the people that were yes. involved. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was av it was readily and easily available to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it did cost. It did cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm paying that back mm -hmm. now. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the beauty of this is that that was the dead person. That person is dead. That person no longer exists. That's right. You are a new creature That's right. in Christ. Amen. So all, all the former things are passed away. And what you have now is a how I got over, how I got through testimony right. Right. by the grace of God. It was only God. Yes, uh -huh. yes. I had nothing to do. I was just the body. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, your whole countenance, I mean, uh -huh. your whole countenance is like alive in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's so beautiful to see. Yeah. So how did you go from that place of abject despair? Because by then, I'm sure you're in despair because you have to keep that habit going. Mm -hmm. Or, I or mean, there's that sick? physical dependence, yeah. there's that emotional dependence, everything that goes with addiction. Yeah. Um, it, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And it doesn't, I think people tend to think, well, uh, you know, I have this addiction, but not that addiction. Well, no, so I'm not, I'm not on heroin, but I'm right. on, you know, I'm on prescription drugs. Well, whatever it is, uh -huh. it's an addiction. Mm -hmm. The dynamics are the same. Right. And so it's like, you know, God can deliver yeah. you from whatever yeah. holds you in bondage. Amen. That's what happened. How, tell us how it happened. <laughs> 
So, uh, March 22nd, <laughs> 2017, I was done. I was done with abusing my body. I was done with allowing others to abuse me. I was just done and I got on my knees, which I don't, I, I just don't do, or I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And I cried out. I was in tears, I was bawling, and I was yelling. And I, was, I said, Lord, you have to help me get off of this because I cannot do it on my own. And it was like, boom, I had a plan. I didn't know what it was, but I made a phone call. And then I made another phone call. And then, you know, my parents, um, as, as, I mean, as tormented as we were growing up, mm -hmm. you know, they were still there for me. Yeah. And I asked them, because I am a nurse, mm -hmm. if I, I felt like if I were to ask for help in the medical professional, or profession, that it may, I may have some, uh, other things that I might have to go through or, yes. or get in, in more trouble. Mm -hmm. So I asked if I could do it withdrawal uh, at their home. Wow, cold turkey? Cold turkey. Wow. Ooh, from 300 milligrams? Mm -hmm. What was that like? Uh, <laughs> ooh. Awful. Ooh, wow. I would not recommend that. <laughs> right. I, I would not recommend yes. it. Yes. Yeah. It's very scary. But yeah. one, one point to consider here, though, uh -huh. opioids, and you know, our country is dealing with this. Uh -huh. you know, oh, oh, more people die from opioids than automobile accidents. Mm. And you know, there's like oh, close to 200 people a day that are dying from opioid overdose. And she was very close to that. I mean, yeah. And of course, the alcohol prior to that, you know, she could tell you more about the alcohol and, and what that did. But then from alcohol to opioids, um, opioids do not cause death upon withdrawal. Hmm. It's not like, you know, even alcohol, you can have DTs mm. or de delirium Doom tremens tremor. or benzos. You can have uh, benzo withdrawal seizures. You don't seize from opioid withdrawal. In fact, opioids can cause seizures. So if anything, you're more resistant to seizures mm. during the withdrawal. It's extreme dysphoria. Mm. So it's a terrible experience, but it's not one that you will actually die from opioid withdrawal. Okay. Mm. Now you can have, uh, well, and sh she'll explain. Uh, tell us about some of the symptoms that you had. So um, in the very beginning, um, I probably could not formulate a full sentence. I had racing thoughts and just rambling on. Then the lethargy uh, set in and I had no energy. Um, and about 48 hours, um, I was throwing up um, nonstop, uh, probably every 15 minutes. And um, were you replacing your fluids or anything? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I was trying to, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. anytime I put anything in my body, it would come right back up. Mm. So I did what I could. I sucked on a lot of ice during that time. Mm -hmm. I tried to drink the water. I, it just would not stay down. Um, I got in the shower a lot. Mm. Was anybody with you kind of walking you through this process? My parents were kind of listening in the background, but I was on my own. Mm. Yeah. And then because opioids cause constipation on withdrawal, you get diarrhea. Mm. And so you had the yeah. nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. diarrhea. Mm. Um, wow. And she get, did get dehydrated. And I was now the say. dehydration can kill you, but yeah. that's not that's something that can actually be um, treated without having to give right. opioids. Right, of uh -huh. course. And so she did go. I did go to the emergency ER room. Because okay. She was dehydrated. Because I would think so with the yeah. vomiting and the diarrhea and you know losing yeah. all of that fluid. And I guess what they wanted to do when she went to the ER. No. Mm -hmm. Give her. Give her opioids. Give her opioids. Wow. Oh. They wanted they to get the me out of the withdrawal. Oh wow. my. 
So but she I, refused. I refused. She wow. had, I mean, that's why God was involved. She says, oh, yeah. whatever you do, don't give me opioids. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't want back on them. That's right. So they hydrated her up with IVs and mm -hmm. they gave her antiemetics and right. they discharged her from the ER. Yes. Wow. Because I had no insurance. <laughs> they <couldn't laughs> do anything with me. Yeah. That'll get you out of there <laughs> quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you went, th what was, how long was the process? The whole, um, it was 10 days detoxification. of detoxification. Wow. And it's thir it was about 30 days before I started to feel normal mm. or not really normal, just that I could actually go up a flight of stairs without having to stop wow. in the middle yeah. and catch my breath or so it this took the energy out. It, it took a yeah. pretty big chunk out of your life mm. too, right? Yeah, I mean, you weren't able to function. You weren't, you didn't have a job at the time. No. Yeah. I quit my job two years prior to my uh, sober date because I couldn't function. Wow. But she already didn't have a job. <laughs> yeah. Because of yeah. the addictions. Yeah. 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 How long were you, uh, the, the, how long was the total time of addiction for you? I would say from 10 years on yeah. from that first cigarette. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do it, go ahead. Well, yes. and I, I don't know if you want to say your age on March 22, <laughs> 1917, <laughs> but uh, it was years. 38. Yeah, 2017. So, yeah, 2017. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I, so that means 28 years wow. of addictions. Wow. Uh, from age 10 to 38. Mm -hmm. wow. But then the story doesn't end when the opioids are done. Mm -hmm. Right. Because many times people that utilize substances, they're self-medicating because there's emotional pain underneath mm -hmm. it all. Mm -hmm. So now with her commitment to not have self-medication, no opioids, no alcohol, none of those things, what happened? I became suicidal, mm. or I was thinking about suicide a lot mm. because I just could not deal with that emotional pain. In a way, this is where people feel trapped because they know I can't go back to the opioids because that was a terrible life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't go back to the alcohol because that's a terrible life. Mm -hmm. So my ways of self-medicating aren't working. And, but yet now I have this severe depression mm -hmm. to the point where what is the point of life? And maybe I should just, I'd be better off dead. Yeah. And so with that feeling of trapped and the feeling down, she started to get into the hopelessness part yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. And they started making plans. Mm -hmm. And this is where God was involved again. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. yes. Because her plan, would have been successful that day. Tell us about that. So, um, I, um, I, during the, with, okay, so I didn't tell you this. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, when I went to my parents' house to withdrawal, I also brought my gun mm. and I brought bullets. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, I just did. Mm -hmm. And, when I was that desperate, when I was, you know, going through the emotions and I was sober, um, I just couldn't take it. And I went up to my bedroom and I pulled the gun out and I went to put the bullets in and I, I grabbed the wrong ones. They wouldn't fit. Wow. Oh. But then I was like, okay, well, if I can't do it this way, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to jump in front of a car. And I, that, and I did it immediately without a second thought. And I went down to that busy intersection and I was just waiting for the right car. And a childhood friend was at the corner at a stop sign. In a car. In a car and called out my name. And I looked over at her and she looked at me and she said, are you okay? And I was like, no. I am not okay. And so she told me to get in her car and I told her what was going on and she got me to my first um, AA meeting. Mm -hmm. 
I needed something. Yeah, sure. You know, so wow. that started my support group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God had her right, right there. there. Look, yeah. Look at the time. Right man. on time. Yes. Look and at a the busy time. intersection. Yes. A yeah. busy intersection. Yeah. Look at God. Right. <laughs> he has such a plan for your life. <laughs> I believe it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Nedley, let me ask you this. Were these suicidal ideations that she was having, were they a result of the chemical imbalance that was there as a result of the opioid addiction, you think? I mean, it's not just, it, it's emotional too, but can there not also be a physiological basis oh, yes. for yeah. the depression? Yeah, and of course that's why she was self-medicating with opioids as well, because right. she would feel bad and she would take that, but of course, since it's a frontal lobe suppressant and all of those other things, it's not like she could really analyze her life on a day-by-day -day basis on how well is this working. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, she had lost her job and out without employment for two years and finally came to a moment of sobriety where she realized, I need to get rid of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet she didn't realize what life was gonna be like without that because right. there was some underlying pain issues, even unresolved things from childhood. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, some, some brain chemical changes going on in her. And then, um, you know, not having any sense of fulfillment. And, and of course there's been other stressors of life that we haven't yeah. Mention. I don't know if you want to mention some of the other ones that are pretty big that you know that she was covering up with all of this. Mm. What What are you thinking? <laughs> a lot of ways There's a lot tell. there. Well, I mean, you know, you talked about the the being pregnant. What What happened um, to yeah. your child? I have a daughter. She's ten years old, mm -hmm. and because of my choices. She lives with her grandparents and her father. Mm. Yeah. So. That's also so hard, I'm yeah. sure. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now that your choices are so different, can that be reversed in any way? There's always hope. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have to give it to the Lord because yes. I am powerless yes. over that situation. Yeah. But there's no one better to give it to. That's right. right? <laughs> the omnipotent. Right. Where we are powerless, yeah. he's omnipotent. So, yeah. He is definitely the one up for the challenge. Yes. yes. <laughs> so how did you come to turn everything over to him? Let's talk about the reversal. How did you come to reverse? So my grandparents, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, um, they both got sick. Um, and I was about six months sober and still miserable, mm -hmm. you know, and those suicidal thoughts were, they were coming back and I just wasn't being honest about it. And my grandmother called and just said, you know, we really need your help. Just come down here and, you know, you can take care of us and we'll take care of you. And you know, we'll get through this, just mm -hmm. please get down here. And so they're in Florida, and I, I drove from Virginia to Florida. Wow. And uh, um, I thought things were gonna be great there. Mm -hmm. And they were for about a couple weeks, and, um, but then the thoughts were coming back, and I was isolating a lot, mm -hmm. and um, food now became my addiction. I probably gained about 40 pounds when I was there. I was sneak eating at night and it, I was pretty miserable. And then I was definitely uh, planning another attempt. Mm. Um, and my grandmother, who has been my number one fan, <laughs> <laughs> and a very loyal um, daughter of God. Mm. Mm -hmm. Picked up on it. Wow. And I heard her on the phone from my father saying, she is going to die if we don't do something. Mm. And I, I just remember thinking, I'm not gonna die. 
And then I was like, oh, wait, how does she know? Does she, know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she must know. God's telling her something, I bet. <laughs> and um, she was the one who suggested that I call the Nedley Health Solution and um, set up my appointment to go to the Depression Recovery Program. Wow. And Grandma is really the only one that I listen to. So when <laughs> Grandma says something, you do it. <laughs> so what was it like when you went to the program? Oh, man, it was so beautiful. <laughs> it was like a vacation, but it was, it was like um, self-help vacation. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I learned how to deal with those untrue negative thoughts. Um, that I had been telling myself since before I was 10 years old. Um, you know, I learned how to be easy on myself. I learned how to start a relationship with the Lord. And that the Lord, He's not my earthly father. He's my heavenly father. And there is a distinction, mm -hmm. a huge distinction. And... You know, I look to him for guidance now. Um, I was just met with so much love mm -hmm. and acceptance, even with them knowing how bad my life had become. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that I was the one that caused most of those problems, mm -hmm. <laughs> if not all of them. And um, I learned that I can also forgive, but I can do it with boundaries, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I also learned that in order to forgive, I have to let it go, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And really to truly be happy You really just have to forgive and let it go. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You can't hang on to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's not it's not really that's not God either, you know. That's mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. what God wants us to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She went through a lot of behavioral changes too. <laughs> <laughs> Such as? Uh, the, but the thought part, I'm glad you centered in on that because the, the program starts out with more behavioral changes, mm. you know, physical exercise. I don't know if you've exercised. <laughs> oh, yeah. Before, uh, no. In coming to the program, <laughs> the hydrotherapy, the contrast baths, and mm -hmm. the diet uh, change. And the diet. In fact, I don't know, were you the, uh, the biggest loser in the program or close to it? I was close to it. I like the food too yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> I would have lost more, but there was a bread bar. <laughs> and how much did you lose during and in also the program, after? And um, after as well. In the program, I lost, in 10 days, I lost 12 pounds. What? And that was oh. like kind of overeating with the exercise <laughs> so That's yeah tremendous. it was great but in in all actuality okay let me do the math <laughs> I just got on the scale the other day I don't want to give my weight away <laughs> no. oh, I can certainly <laughs> relate to that <laughs> I've I've lost uh 60 pounds Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> so that is incredible so how did the physical changes impact the mental Wow, I mean, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't exercise, um, I feel it. You know, it uh, maybe not the next day or maybe not that day, but in a couple days, I'll feel it. Mm -hmm. Like my mood will, I'll be short tempered or a little like angry for no reason, or it, it'll just be like a, you know, it'll catch me off guard. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm like, oh, yep, skip, skip my exercise, or I skip my hydro, or, you know, I had cheese. 
<laughs> Maybe that's why I'm upset. <laughs> we'll blame the cheese. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful, though. Yeah. I mean, we can look at you and see that, you know, you, you just have a glow about you mm -hmm. and yeah. a real peace Thank in your countenance. Amen. God can do amazing things. But, uh, let me just share this one scripture. Um, Philippians 4, 6. From the New King James, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that's what you've done. You've gone to God. You've placed your, your requests at His feet. You've thanked Him for His answers, mm. and He's given you His peace. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And that is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, so, and, she's, and she's working again, and, and she's now actually doing Bible studies with others and leading amen. them. Amen, <laughs> yes. Uh, towards the, the pathway that leads to healing. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. D does your facility, your, your program, does it deal with um, nicotine, tobacco addiction? Absolutely, and, yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, we keep data on all of our, our programs, but even our community program, because we have a residential, but we also have an outpatient community program. Okay. Our data on 6,000 people shows that when they come to a depression and anxiety recovery program, mm -hmm. they're actually more likely to give up their addictions than if they go to a program that just centers in on their addiction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we're dealing with the underlying brain chemistry issues yes. as well as the thought issues because when people do get sober, even in AA, they'll teach you your worst year of life is going to tend to be your first year of sobriety. Mm. But it won't be that way if we can help the brain chemical issues as well as help get rid of what, you know, Uncle Bob and AA calls the stinking thinking, yeah. uh, which <laughs> yeah. is the negative automatic thoughts that are actually, you know, not true or at least partially not true. And that's what she had gotten into was this the stinking thinking when she mm. couldn't cover, stop the, th the thoughts altogether with the drugs. Mm -hmm. Now you have to deal with those thoughts, but how healthfully she's dealing with them now. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you find that um, if you were to summarize where you are now in the Lord and just emotionally, what would you say? I wouldn't even recognize myself if I was, so, you know, in, in the world or I would not recognize who I am today. Um, and I don't recognize the girl in pictures, you know, from a couple years ago. Mm. It just baffles me. I would say that my relationship with the Lord is, um, it's growing every day. And I really appreciate the little miracles and the responses that I get from him, as subtle as they are. Yes. They're huge. Yes. You know, and sometimes I don't know what they mean, but that it's not for me to know, I guess. Mm. You know, he's, he's the one in charge. That's I'm just right. just the body. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. He gave you a huge hug when he had that friend sitting on that corner. Yes. <laughs> he gave you a huge hug then. Amen. Yes. Yes. Sure. yes. Yeah. 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 Most of your uh, patients at the facility have amazing testimonies, I would imagine, by the end of their oh, yes. time there. How long is the, is the treatment program? Well, the treatment program is a 10-day program. So this is all done in 10 days. Wow. And um, so wow. not everyone do we recommend they go home in 10 days uh -huh. because, but Kelly endorsed everything. Mm -hmm. I think partly due to the fact that she was already sober. You know, some people come and they're already, you know, they're, they're on these drugs and we're having to, you know, take them off. And mm -hmm. then they start having the stinking thinking even while they're, they're part of the program and they may need more than 10 days. Mm -hmm. But since she was already off of the drugs, when she came through the program, she complied with every aspect of the program. Wow. And as a result, as severe as her depression was, suicidal depression, she left actually with no depression. <laughs> mm. 
mm. and she left with no anxiety, but we had to tell her, your brain has started to change, but it hasn't changed all the way. It takes right. 20 weeks to solidify this process. Mm -hmm. 20 weeks? 20 weeks. Okay. And so we gave her a discharge plan to yes. continue on for 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, she did the plan. Wow. I stuck to it. <laughs> And but I had help. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you so much for sharing your testimony uh -huh. with us, Kelly. It's, mm -hmm. been, it's beautiful, and we know that God has great plans for you. Thank you. Yes. You know, you just have to hold on and That's continue right. walking with Him. And thank you, too, Dr. Nedley. Don't go anywhere, and don't you go anywhere. We're, we're so blessed to have these testimonies this evening mm -hmm. because we there's so many people who are going through depression anxiety OCD all kinds of issues that are affecting our behavior so stay tuned don't go anywhere stay tuned we'll be right back <laughs> Welcome back to 3ABN Today Live. If you're just joining us now, you're going to have to get a copy of the first part of this program because you're not going to want to miss that part. <laughs> uh, we are here with Dr. Neil Nedley. He is the director of the Nedley Health Solutions um, program. And we have two new guests with us now, Stacy Garcia and Frank Cohen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're so glad to have you. So we were talking earlier with Kelly about her journey, and now we want to talk to you, Frank, about your journey. Um, Dr. Nelly, set us up a little bit uh, about Frank, and then Frank can take it from there. Yeah, well, uh, Frank had a number of things going on before we met when he came to the program. Frank and I first met, of course, when he came through the Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program uh, not too long ago. When was when uh, February of okay. this year. Yeah, and so, uh, uh, but tell us, Frank, what was going on? Uh, it actually starts quite a time before that, mm. and, uh, and then it kind of builds. But uh, tell us about some of the issues that brought you there. I, I had probably two big issues that, um, that I was dealing with. One was an issue that occurred when I was uh, uh, stationed um, overseas in the Navy, and I had... Um, uh, lost a good friend of mine um, and had sort of taken responsibility for that and I had carried that with me for mm. uh, a long time. And the other, which is probably the biggest part, is um, was an issue of chronic pain. I had uh, a broken my back and neck back in the 70s um, when I was in the service and um, have had to date now about 15 or 16 spinal surgeries, my back wow. and my neck. And um, I think that was a big part of it was, you, you know, people in chronic pain have to do all the things that people aren't in chronic pain have to do. You raise families, you work, mm -hmm. you have to take care of all the daily things, but you have to do it in pain all the time. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big uh, issues that I had. And it just gets discouraging after a while and it makes it very difficult to, uh, to stay focused on what you're doing. I, I can't imagine dealing with pain every single day. Like, you know, you have pain sometimes it, intermittently, uh -huh. but to have it every single day, and as you just said, to have to do the normal activities of life, but with pain. Mm -hmm. So the natural inclination is to medicate, to do something, yeah. do something to get rid of this pain. Mm -hmm. And that's where you found yourself? Well, I mean, I, I had a, an unfortunate background with drugs, but it wasn't necessarily uh, for that. I, I have some um, social anxiety uh, issues, and uh, uh, I medicated for that. 
more than I did um, for the pain. The pain I just dealt with as best as I could um, just because I didn't have many solutions left for it. Mm. So what, what was your, your childhood like? How did you grow up? Um, it was a bit problematic. Um, I, was, um, I had problems in school, um, social and behavioral problems most of the time growing up. And uh, um, I'm grateful my parents kept me off of the medications that a lot of the kids ended up on at that time. But it made it very difficult for me to, um, to interact with people in a healthy, uh, healthy way. So um, when I ended up, um, uh, my introduction to drug addiction actually was that I found that I could uh, become a little more normal socially. But after a while, that just, you know, goes away. It's like... What was your initial drug of choice? Well, um, it was... Uh, I, actually, I, I prefer not to even say that, if that's okay. It was all drugs. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, everything sure. but alcohol. I, I didn't drink because I couldn't, but pretty much everything else was for open open game. So did that af affect your ability to function? Oh, big time. I mean, you know, besides the, the legal issues and the other troubles that it brings along with it, um, you know, I, I couldn't function in a family. Uh, I couldn't hold a job. Mm -hmm. You know, the work that I sought after, my, what my career is now, is requires a great deal of focus and I couldn't, couldn't do it then. Yeah. So I just bounced around a lot. Mm. And I think that, that there are probably a lot of young people who are in that same kind of situation where they can't focus mm -hmm. and where they are having trouble functioning in everyday life, mm -hmm. just having difficulties functioning. Mm -hmm. Even ended up um, homeless, I remember. Yeah, yeah I had lost, uh, I had gone through a divorce and uh, my house had burned down and I ended up jobless and I was living in my van for, I mean, I don't want to uh, take away from how um, terrible it is to be homeless for people that are truly homeless long term. So I was on, only there for a short period of time, but yeah, it was, uh, things can get out of hand, yeah. you know? And, and I think, I'll say, cause I, I really worked with Don at the program and some of the spiritual parts of this. But it, it's not those individual addictions that are the problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the more we separate from God, those become just symptoms and manifestations mm -hmm. of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I learned it was a lot easier to deal with one problem than all of those things yeah. mm -hmm. individually. Yeah. That was a big lesson there. How did you bounce back from the homelessness? Oh, I, I mean, it, it was only, it was maybe about six or eight months or so that that went on and, and I just, uh, I was in a, um, a program of recovery. I had a, a fairly good support group. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't do it by myself, yeah. for sure, yeah. you know. Or else I'd still be out there probably. I think that's very important too, to consider that, you know, when you're going through this, you need some support. You need people around you who are gonna care. And you also, I think that if you're not, if you don't have a spiritual bent or spiritual orientation, then you're missing so much. You can't, you can't really do it without God. It does, to me, it's just like. Yeah, you you, I mean, you might make some little behavioral modifications, right. but you won't have that genuine transformation. And that genuine tr transformation is what's going to last and right. long lasting. Well, I, I think that's why the suicide rates are so high. It's, I think a lot amongst people who don't have a relationship with Christ and, you know, I mean, if this is all there was, this mm. was it, mm. I, I can see, I can understand that, you know, mm -hmm. how people would become that discouraged that, um, that they would take their own lives. So how did you come to know God? Um, so I was born and raised Jewish mm -hmm. and, uh, um, fairly orthodox. My grandparents were orthodox. My, my parents were conservative. But I had met uh, somebody, a young lady. Um, this goes back about 30 years, 30 years ago. And uh, we were having a, uh, 
a pretty um, heated conversation, not heated, but a very intense conversation about who Jesus Christ was and if he was really the son of God. Because, you know, every Passover, we would put a cup of wine out and wait for Elijah to come by and still to, to, to bring in the Messiah, which we just missed that one little point that had <laughs> already happened. And um, um, she said to me, I remember this, she said, well, you're a pretty smart guy. So I imagine to have that strong of an opinion, you've probably read through the Bible several times. And I went, well, never actually. <laughs> and she gave me a Bible and I, uh, I went home and I spent the next five or six hours, I read through the gospels, the first four books, and I was instantly converted. Wow. Really? Instantly, yep. Wow. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I just from, that, from reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that was it for you. Well, I mean, to me, if, if you have a logical mind, if you're critically thinking, it's fairly hard to miss that point. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty well laid out there in a fairly logical way. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't understand how people miss it now. You know, maybe mm -hmm. I'm too far from that time now, but I don't get how do you miss something that's that well structured? You know? Yes. Uh -huh. The word of the Lord does convert. Yes. <laughs> so. What's well, living? Uh -huh. I mean, it's a living word. The line was earlier in life, but when I was 15, it was actually reading the Bible yep. that converted me as well. Hmm. It wasn't an individual or anything like that. It was just reading the Bible uh -huh. that uh, brought me to my transformed life. Amen. Speaking of which, what made you want to go into this line of work? Well, Christ was a healer. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful honor and a privilege to be involved in, in helping and being his hands and his feet and his voice in helping others to uh, get to that pathway of healing and transformation. Yes. And so, uh, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, certainly Christ's model and example is, is a main reason. Although my father um, made some changes in his life when I was a teenager growing up and I saw a new father emerge, mm -hmm. behaviorally made some changes with positive diet. Positive or negative? Oh, positive. Oh. Uh -huh. Diet, exercise, those type of things. And I saw a new father emerge and so I knew there was a lot to what you put into your body yes. and what you do with your body is crucially important in regards to how healthy and even how happy you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I always had an interest in nutrition and in lifestyle uh, medicine and always paid attention to those things all the way through medical school and specialty training and, mm -hmm. and end up emphasizing and seeing um, the powerful impact that that makes. Wow, wow. What a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a difference. absolutely. So, Back to Brother Frank for a minute. So you, you found Jesus, and how did that impact your, your journey as far as the addiction and depression and all that? How did, how did finding Jesus impact your life? Well, I mean, I, I had, the addiction was, was um, gone at that point, or at least a, a good part of it mm -hmm. had gone away from the drugs and all that, but you know, sometimes our behaviors don't necessarily change as mm. quickly as, as the withdrawal from the drugs does or, or whatever the addiction is. You know, we, we carry that behavior on sometimes. So it was uh, progressive. I, I, I'll just tell you, remember that we had a very um, conservative pastor. I love the guy, he was great. And uh, I was still smoking. I had a, was wearing an earring and and um, I went to him and I said, I got to get baptized. I said, I just feel like I'm being chased by Satan and I got to get baptized. I had met a pastor um, several weeks before and he said, sometimes he said, you have to make the decision and then you learn to love. And I thought that was great. He was talking about arranged marriages actually. He was from, from India and he was talking to me about that. And um, so I, I said, I, you know, I, I need to get baptized. And he said, well, when are you going to quit smoking? And I said, Friday night before my baptism, you know. <laughs> and, he, and he said, well, when are you going to take that earring out? And I said, oh, Friday night before I get baptized, you know. And he baptized me anyway. 
I thought, I, I thought like he got extra points because I was Jewish or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but he did it. He was a great guy, and and that it was it's it, it's progressive, you know. I'm I'm still progressing through it. It was 1992 that I I got baptized, and I mean every day a new truths are revealed. My relationship with Christ continues to grow, you know, back a step sometimes, forward a couple steps. It's 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 fairly fluid, you know. It's a dynamic process, yes. is what it is. So, you know, it progressed. It progresses quickly at first, and then there's sort of a lull, and then it sort of takes on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. how did, Good for me. How did your decision impact your relationship with uh, family members? Uh, it was tough on my parents, mm -hmm. my mom in particular. The fact that they didn't sit shiva or have a funeral for me, which mm -hmm. is really quite typical, was surprising, but. Um, I had a phone call from my mom one time, and, and she said, uh, do you still believe that Jesus stuff? <laughs> and I didn't want to minimize it, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. And you still go to that church? Yeah, I do. I thought maybe I'd be Peter when she asked me that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there was just silence on the other line. And I thought, oh, this is it. And she said, well, you don't mind if I don't brag about this to my friends, do you? And I said, no, that's fine. She said, well, how about we just never talk about it again? Well, honor thy mother and father. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've, I've gone that route with it. When you went to the Nedley Health Solutions Program, where were you and in terms of your functioning? And where are you now? Well, I can tell you that I was um, um, cognitively was challenged. You know, I was having a hard time um, finishing projects, starting projects, getting focused, all the typical things that you see about, um, about depression as it comes in. And actually my wife had, uh, had asked me about considering the program. She never asked me anything like that. So I knew, and, and she's really got a gift of discernment. And I knew that if she saw this, and I didn't, it must be really bad. You know, mm -hmm. so so we called and, and uh, made arrangements, and uh, it was you know tough at first. They picked me up at the airport in a shuttle with a bunch of people I don't know, and probably my biggest one of my biggest anxieties is being around a bunch of people I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is not a good start you know, <laughs> uh, to the program, and but but I can tell you that that there are there were three things that it focused on. It focused on the mental, the spiritual and the um, physical parts. And, mm -hmm. and all three of those things were addressed uh, during the program. You know, I, I thought I was doing a lot of things right, but I wasn't, you know. And, and um, um, uh, you know, I just I can't say how grateful I am that I went there. God knows no hurry and no delay. His timing is impeccable. Yes. So it, it happened exactly when it was supposed to happen, um, for sure. So it was, uh, it was a struggle before I went, without a doubt. You know, with 16 surgeries on his spine as well, and the pain and all of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't know until someone goes through the program, you know, how that's going to be, but I didn't have real high hopes that this pain would, um, would really get any better as it had over, you know, many years. But I remember Frank, as it was getting close to the end of the program, uh, he said, you know, my pain is going away. Mm. And uh, he said the last couple of days, what, what did you say? Actually, I had, I believe, the first pain-free day in my entire adult life occurred there. Wow. At the program. Really? I remember that. I remember that. And, and it was the, the contrast baths. Mm. As a matter of fact, when I went home, I went to Rural King and I bought... Um, a hundred gallon galvanized feed tub and I filled it with water and I got 10 gallons of, of water, 10 gallon jugs and I put them in the freezer and I would throw them in that tub and I'd Ooh. get in the hot tub for five minutes and jump in the cold tub at 50 degrees for a minute and it's made a significant, that probably was one of the most beneficial. That and some of the dietary things that I learned there uh, really made a big difference as far as the foods that cause inflammation and whatnot. Yes. So, so you know, I'm still in pain but, um, you know, that part of it, we took care of it. And, and you know, working with Don and the spiritual part of it, too. Because I think what happens is we exaggerate things, right? 
I mean, I'm going to have to deal with this forever. But that's not true. I only have to deal with it for the rest of my life. Yeah. But that's not forever. That's uh, right. So I can handle it till the end of this life because now I know I don't have to take it with me into eternity. Yeah. So, so that was a, big, was a big change for me as far as, you know, if you can't get rid of it, you're going to have to learn to, to just embrace it. And that was a big part of it. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. I remember on our last visit, you know, I said, you know, I was looking at his scores because we evaluate. And I said, you know, Frank, I think you are ready to go, you know, at the 10 day point. I see significant improvement here or there mm -hmm. and here in, in uh, multiple areas, uh, emotional intelligence going up significantly. And even the social part uh, was uh, uh, significant changes. And, uh, and he says, you know, I know others are staying. Is there a possibility I can stay? Because I think this is, uh, you know, helping me, and I think I'll even get better if I stay longer. Nice. And so uh, yep. he stayed an extra week, I think. And in in the face of the fact that it rained 15 of those 17 days, if you remember, every wow. single wow. day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so. wow. As a matter of fact, I just tell you that my father passed away my third day at the program. Oh. I remember that. Wow. Yes. My. And uh, that was tough. But I wasn't going home because I was so committed. I knew that if I left, I wouldn't come back. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you're given a last chance. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and so, but I will tell you that the staff was amazing. Mm -hmm. they, I've never experienced that kind of a solidarity. Mm -hmm. You know, they circled the wagons. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and so I was able to stay through that. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Stacy, what about you? you? You've been sitting there so quietly and <laughs> <laughs> waiting your turn. What about you? Tell us about your journey. Um, my journey, I, from I'd say about college um, is when I started noticing signs of anxiety, depression, um, manifesting themselves through nursing school and that was when I first started noticing the, some of the warning signs. And um, my freshman year of college, actually, I was part of a gymnastics team. And um, we were getting ready for a show when I had a, a fall. I was one of the, the flyers and um, had a fall that resulted in a pretty, pretty good break, ankle mm -hmm. break. <laughs> Um, By flyer, they're they're way up there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they and toss you around, and this was more of a topping a pyramid type. Okay. But yes, I yeah, we would do some flying too. Mm -hmm. um, that break left me essentially with instant arthritis, and um, so at the age of 19, I had uh, no cartilage left in my ankle, oh. and it was it was pain. Lots of pain. Mm -hmm. Broke both the tibia and the fibula. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. those are both of those lower leg bones yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And then crushed the top of the talus and they had to just take out all the cartilage. So it was a good break. Yeah. Which is part of the foot too. Yeah, so. yeah. 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 Um, so that kind of, that started, that changes your lifestyle a bit when you go from being very active to just having to stop and think about, okay, if I take this long walk today, I'm going to be sore the next couple of days, not walking as efficiently and going to be in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I was on, um, I was put on Percocet just after my surgery mm -hmm. and came off it very quickly with my um, parents pushing. <laughs> because we already kind of knew from seeing others going through mm -hmm. um, withdrawals where it could lead to. Mm -hmm. So pretty quickly went off to just Tylenol and Motrin, and, which doesn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. So you learn to kind of find other ways to manage pain and most more often than not, that's decreasing your lifestyle. Um, so basically from there, um, just life as I knew it began to change, but I kept going with, uh, I was in nursing school. It was gonna be a profession where I was gonna be on my feet a lot, but you know, I felt that's where the Lord was leading me. 
and um, yeah, you were a Christian at this point. Yes, okay. yes, I was raised um, in an Adventist home. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say my true conversion came later in life, mm -hmm. but I had the the foundation from childhood. Um, through nursing school, there's a lot of pressure for exams, and and I began. I think it was my senior year was when pa uh, panic attacks began setting in, and mm. um, that was the when I was first put on um, medications to help with anxiety, uh, depressions. I was in a fairly, I guess, volatile relationship at the time too, not a very healthy relationship. Um, that eventually, it was putting a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, added stress in my young life. Mm -hmm. And um, that relationship actually um, became an engagement. And um, I'd say about, it was about a month before the wedding that a, an argument led to a physical encounter mm -hmm. um, on myself. And it took, it kind of, I think it took that to kind of wake me up and help me walk away from this unhealthy situation I was in. Um, but from there, I kind of took the approach of moving on with life, not dealing with it healthily. And um, I moved out to Loma Linda, and in the course of the next few years, I met my husband, mm -hmm. and we were married, um, I believe it was almost three years later. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we left Loma Linda with two children, two beautiful boys. And um, when we left Loma Linda um, and moved into our new home, I, I felt like, you know, I was living the dream. I had a, a wonderful, loving husband, mm -hmm. two beautiful boys, healthy, happy as can be. Mm -hmm. um, but yet there was this nagging unhappiness. This couldn't, couldn't really put it into words. Mm -hmm. And a few other um, events arose that started bringing up feelings um, that I had been suppressing of when you think back on a traumatic event, think of things that you could have done different. Why didn't I fight for myself harder? Mm -hmm. How did I let it get to this point? How did I not see all the red flags leading up to here? And one thing compounds on another. And in the next, I'd say, the course of a year or two, it kind of came to a head. And I found myself barely able to get out of bed, mm. um, barely functioning, and my children got to be the, they got the firsthand account of seeing what all mom was going through. Mm -hmm. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, if you ran into me in the street, this is what you'd see, mm -hmm. just a smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of times what depression can look like yeah. in some people. You learn to put up a a happy face, mm -hmm. tell people what they want to hear, and um, when they don't know what's going on on the inside. Right. And um, I can't exactly pinpoint an exact moment when, um, when I realized oh, I need help, but it was over a period of time where there were days I would wake up don't want to get out of bed mm -hmm. and even in the nighttime going to bed thinking lord can you just let me fall asleep tonight and maybe not wake up mm -hmm. because you you start to believe um the lie that you're telling yourself that your family would be better off without you mm -hmm. and i never came up with a plan or put anything into action but those thoughts became so overwhelming. And I remember driving one day and looking in my rear view mirror at my children, and there's those thoughts again, like it could just, it could be done so quickly. Mm -hmm. And then they could have the mother that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And your husband could have the wife that he deserves. Um, but then I see their little faces mm -hmm. and and God can use even those sweet little children just to, you know, to remind me 
Well, they need you. Mm -hmm. Your family mm -hmm. needs you, and we have a purpose for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I talked with my husband that night. Um, he had no idea where I was at because even from him, I was hiding things. And mm -hmm. it's sometimes harder to share those things with your spouse because things that are so out of his control that he can't heal, that he can't take away, right. it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's why God gave us that person, that special person in our life. Mm -hmm. And he, he became my, my strongest support. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about, well, what are we gonna do from here? I didn't want to go back on medications. That was one thing I knew. And it's very common nowadays that you go to a doctor, you tell them a problem, and here's a pill. Yeah. Right. Yep. And I yeah. didn't want any pills. Right. Yeah. And um, I knew about Dr. Nelly's program from um, uh, family members that had gone through the community program. They hadn't gone out to um, to California themselves, but uh, and just seeing what it did in their lives, um, coming off medications completely and being at a severe, severe level beyond where I, you know, even thought myself to be mm. um, and seeing how it changed their life, mm -hmm. I, I decided that that's, that's what I want to do. Yes. So. The Lord had his hand on you the whole time. I mean, he had a plan for you obviously to go to this program to get help. It's just so, again, you know, you watch how the devil just tries to take you into that dark place. And yet God has such a, a marvelous light to bring you into. And um, so was it, did you have flashbacks? Were you having flashbacks from the previous relationship? I was, mm -hmm. yes. Um, there were some, other instances that happened um, that brought what happened with me back to light. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I guess, in hearing um, other ha events which transpired, uh, started bringing um, uh, nightmares that I used to okay. have. Mm -hmm. um, it was always the same same thing over and over and I would have that nightmare multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. I would wake up crying or screaming and my husband, I know more than once I woke him up and he, I would just say, oh, it's just, sorry, just a bad dream, mm -hmm. you know, go back to sleep. But uh, it got to where if he was working a night shift at the hospital, then I would stay up all night because I'd create these um, scenarios in my head that weren't realistic. They weren't, you know, they have no, no basis other than my mind just imagining up worst case scenarios of what can happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I would dwell on them. Mm -hmm. And that, that was definitely contributed to a downward spiral of yes. mm -hmm. getting to a place of desperation. So what happened when you went to the program to, uh, Nedley Health Solutions, what, so, what happened? <laughs> um, many things actually. So we of course, um, we address the mental aspect of it, the spiritual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even the physical. Um, I was able to get counseling, which really helped me with teaching me how to reframe some of these thoughts that come to mind, how to twist things into a positive light and even things with uh, we talked about my, my ankle um, and just how that was even affecting my lifestyle as a mother, you know, not being able to run and play with my children, yeah. like simple things that it kind of robs you of. And um, Dr. Nedley actually suggested, asked if, I had, asked if I had heard of something called Boswellia. And hmm. no, I haven't heard of this. And <laughs> he told me about it. It's a frankincense derivative. and. And you know, when he told me this, I just put on a smile and a nod. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give that a try. <laughs> I had, you know, I was very um, skeptical <laughs> of it, as you know, many people tend to be with anything natural. Just you know, how our world, our thinking nowadays. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, you know, I was open to giving anything a try. So we started on that, and he told me to give it a couple days to start working, and we had. Um, Were you using it topically or internally? Uh, it's a pill form. The herb. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You know, part of um, improving the brain, we need to look at all of the aspects, and it really concerned me her being so young, mm -hmm. not being able to exercise. Mm -hmm. I mean because she really couldn't exercise to the level that was going to really be helpful mm. as far as this brain chemistry is concerned. Yeah. And I knew it would be a multifaceted approach that mm -hmm. was going to produce the, the benefit. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that ankle, my heart went out to her. And when I heard there was no cartilage as well, I thought, well, you know, let's see. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was thinking, of course, she was telling me the things that she had tried, but uh, the Lord brought that to mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened? I, in the mornings, um, would wake up and some mornings you crawl out of bed. You have to stand and do all these exercises to get moving. And I believe it was day two that I woke up and I got out of bed and walked right across the room without even thinking about it. And this is after, I mean, we were, I was pushing myself to walk to uncomfortable levels the first Mm -hmm. just to you know really I really wanted to get everything out of this program mm -hmm. and so I fully expected to not be walking and I just jumped out of bed and started walking across the room uh, hmm. and then it dawned on me oh, I'm walking yeah. <laughs> I don't have pain wow. <laughs> um, and it just got better from there and then I just I think everyone just thought I was really competitive with wanting to walk and outwalk everyone else but Really, and just like, did, I did haven't you win been the able step to test? do this. I think I was second. Second, yeah. <laughs> okay. One of the guys wow. beat me. incredible. <laughs> so does the Boswellia work on the inflammation? Correct. As well as rebuilding the cartilage? Or? Well, I don't know that there's evidence that it rebuilds the cartilage, but it does um, take care of the inflammation. Mm. And there are some things that can rebuild the cartilage, and I'd have to go back into your chart to see if you if we looked at any methylation issues in you mm -hmm. but sometimes if there's under methylation a methylating yes. agent can actually help build cartilage SAMe mm. for instance yeah. has been no mm -hmm. so so you were put on SAMe as yes. well then yes. yeah not only did she go you know to number two and all of the steps and someone who really couldn't walk uh, without limp and pain mm. but with mm. the discharge recommendations and what was happening, mm -hmm. uh, I recommended she continue to train in regards to the brain chemistry. And I think at the 20 week point, we talked about 20 weeks earlier, right. it's kind of for the brain permanently changing. Mm -hmm. What did you do then? I set my goal, I told him I was gonna make my goal to be a do, to do a half marathon. Wow. And he said, wow. oh, you know, that's, that's a pretty big goal, but if you wanna try it. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm gonna do it. And um, I did. <laughs> wow. we did. I did my first, um, yeah, half marathon See, and praise God. Thirteen weeks pregnant too. <laughs> oh, <wait a laughs> another <minute>. another blessing. <laughs> so you went from it being so painful to walk mm -hmm. to, and barely being able to walk mm -hmm. to walking a half marathon, thirteen weeks pregnant. Running a half marathon. Running. Running. Yeah, running. A, Excuse me. Yeah, running. Yeah, we did a run walk because <laughs> wow. of the. The baby, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it, was, incredible. it was and amazing. got pregnant with her third child during those uh, during that twenty weeks. Yes, <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. So the program really actually just totally turned things around for you and by the grace of God. It just our our family life significantly improved, and that's not to say we don't still have. Um, ups and downs, oh, sure. and especially through the pregnancy and um, since having the baby, it, it's been tough because sleep is a big part of mm -hmm. um, being able to keep on track and have energy. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's been taking some work to get back to where we were at. But I mean, that year, the um, the date of when um, the I guess the cause of the PTSD that I was manifesting would come every year, it would just, I would dwell on that day. And after the program, that day came and went without me even wow. thinking about it. It was just my best friend's birthday and nothing else. And it wasn't until weeks later that I realized, hey, 
Hmm. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> yes, yes. It sounds like the program uh, really um, gets to the root cause as opposed to masking the symptoms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. and that's, that's called eradication of depression. <laughs> <and anxiety>. uh -huh. <laughs> A lot of people think today that there is no way that can happen. They talk about controlling it. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you can't get rid of it. You're just right. going to have to kind of managing. It. But yeah. if we get to the root causes and mm -hmm. we reverse those root causes, it actually can be um, eradicated. Doesn't mean it can't come back. If you have the same things in, in place that yeah. brought it about, it yeah. can come back again. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can actually be cured. And that's the goal in every patient. <laughs> wow, that's tremendous. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the, the 20 weeks, yes. Dr. Nedley. So during those, the weeks after, the weeks following mm -hmm. participation in the program, what is the patient doing during that time? Yeah, well, we give them a, a series of recommendations in kind of four areas. Uh, you know, one of the areas has to do with the physical uh, and um, another has to do with nutrition because nutrition plays such a vital role in this. Mm -hmm. And some of the physical things are going to be exercise, it might be contrast showers, it might be light therapy, those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are certain nutritional things, in her case, the Boswellia supplements, the SAMe, uh, getting rid of any inflammation in mm -hmm. the diet. Arachidonic acid is one of those pro-inflammatory mediators that's mm -hmm. present in meat and fish and eggs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, mm -hmm. changing the diet to get rid of the inflammation. And then on top of that, then we talk about the cognitive or the thought aspect of things. So there are certain tasks that we're having them go through. There might be reviewing flashcards mm -hmm. because people with PTSD have a tendency to have a mental filter their, everything that they see is kind of filtered through that traumatic event. And although she didn't go into the traumatic event much, I mean, it was, it was an attempt to take her life. Wow. Um, and, um, and so it was a significant, fortunately, it was um, uh, somebody else came in at the time that that was uh, trying to happen. Otherwise, wow. it might have, um, you know, she might have lost her life in the process. Wow. And so with that mental filter, there we have to teach them to be intentional and forceful to look for evidence to support a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, uh, and so we don't carry that filter with us uh, all the time. Right. And so it has to be intentional and forceful at first, which means you might have to have flashcards. What are the thoughts that are the, my negative automatic thoughts that come? Mm -hmm. What is the replacement? And even review those on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And then there's some reading material that's mm -hmm. completed during the 20 weeks. And then there's also the spiritual part. And so that is yet another um, aspect that we're dealing with in regards to an overall meaning and purpose and being able to enhance the frontal lobe through different uh, uh, ways of uh, focusing in on aspects of the word that can really help in regards to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have counselors in each one of those areas that are there at the program. We have a spiritual counselor that, mm -hmm. that sees them all individually. Um, that's what Frank was talking about uh, when he talked about Don, that's uh, yes. Pastor Don McIntosh oh. uh, that does that. And then we have different cognitive behavioral therapists. We have several of those uh, in the program that are dealing with the thought aspect of things. And then of course, with me dealing with the physical and nutritional part. And so we have professionals on each one of those. So she was uh, working through that mm -hmm. during the 20 weeks. Some need more of a support. And we recommend what's called an extended support plan where they'll actually have a meeting with the therapist every week by Skype mm -hmm. to continue okay. on with the 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. And we'll do follow-up blood work where we want to make sure that we've corrected the biochemical issues right. that are causing it. We'll find some epigenetic issues and we want to make sure, are we actually correcting this? Mm -hmm. And if not, do we need to tweak some things to correct it further? So uh, it's a comprehensive approach. Uh, it's an involved approach, but it is well worth the effort. Yeah. 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 It's an effective yes. approach. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So looking back over your experiences at the program, what would both of you say 
have been the most valuable takeaways from the program? Frank. Um, I, I can't take a single part of it. I mean, it works together. It's a package deal. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, I, if I spend a lot of time really working on my spiritual and my physical, but I ignore the mental aspect, then Satan will see that as a chink in my armor and he'll, mm -hmm. he'll come in and attack me in that way. If I focus on the mental and the spiritual, but I don't take care of my physical part. So, you know, I would be reticent to say that one of those was the most important because, um, you know, um, improving my, um, my nutritional intake had a big part to play in my ability to think more clearly. Mm. I think that's a big part of it, my cognition. Um, going through the cognitive behavioral therapy was important in order to sort of um, uh, disaffect the, uh, what would be a logical thought processes that you know, we fall into because we don't know what else to do. And, and, you know, and, and working with Don on the spiritual part of it was, was hugely important because from that I, I was able to get um, just, he, actually just a couple verses. I mean, I've read the Bible a few times, and, but he came up with these verses that just sort of solved that whole problem for me in an instant, you know. Mm -hmm. So th the best part about it, <laughs> actually is being there on site because it's a boot camp is what it is. <laughs> so I understand people go through this in their communities. I'm, I think that's great, but there's a benefit, um, if, particularly if you're like a kinesthetic learner, to be there in the middle of it when it's going on. Mm. I think the best part was just being there, mm. you know, yeah. if nothing else. It's good. Yeah. What Frank about? has a saying, uh, uh, in regards to God's love that a lot of people don't look at it from that perspective, but uh, go well, ahead, Frank. Mine is that God loves me so much that he allows me to suffer the consequences of my behaviors. Mm -hmm. Because if there were no consequences, I wouldn't have changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just part of being a human is when something hurts, you move away from it. Yes. God allows that pain to come in because he loves me and wants me to be, he cares more about my salvation than he does my day to day, you know. Uh, my wife would say that, that everything happens for a reason, but mm. sometimes the reason is that I just make poor choices. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes. So God that was loves me so much that he allows me to suffer the consequences of my actions yep. uh -huh. that brings me to change. Yes, yep. yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah. that's good actually time. a really good point. Yeah. Really good point. What about you, Stacy? For me, um, I'd say one of the most beneficial things that I took away was um, reframing thoughts. It, and you know, it's easy to focus on the bad things that have happened in mm -hmm. life, the, the hardships that you are given. And if you're focusing on the negative aspect of it, then you're missing all of the positive that's behind that as well. Um, it's, you, can, you can make excuses for only so long and you can say, you know, it, it's tough to have an unfortunate past. Everybody has something that happens, but you have to make the choice that you're not gonna let it keep affecting your future from there forward. Right. And um, they helped me to see that and to reframe those negative thoughts into positive and be able to see, yes, this happened, but now look at what all came about because of it. Mm -hmm. And um, going forward, it's just, you know, a complete new take on life. Yeah. Really. That's, that's a blessing. That sounds like that, uh, even if I remember I was on social media, as we were talking about <laughs> earlier, with being in the screen and all that stuff. And I saw a meme or, or just some kind of quote, and it said uh, something about, you know, we got to get away from the what ifs and uh, grab hold of the even ifs. So yeah. even if this, this happens, I'm trusting in the Lord. Even if this happens, mm. you know, I'm gonna serve the Lord. Even if this happens, I'm gonna praise the Lord. Yeah. And, and get away from the, what if this doesn't work out? What if, what if, what if? Yeah. And even if, and just like you just said, it was, it's that even if. Um, that's good. Type of moment. Yeah, that's good. Stacy also embodies one of the one of my favorite quotes 
uh, and it's kind of also the basis of the program because these are kind of what you what you've seen today are really kind of miracle stories in every mm -hmm. every program you know sometimes I'll see magazines that talk about a miracle story but every program we get to see miracle after miracle yes. happening but in regards to her ankle um, you know I must admit I didn't know how much the Boswellia would help I was hoping it would help some but I didn't anticipate you know the pain being gone and her being number two and then doing a half marathon but <laughs> the the quote that I like is natural means used in accordance with God's will bring about supernatural results. Mm, so nice. I think there was the supernatural mm -hmm. <laughs> also involved with nice. the, the natural choice that brought about the ability um, to run walk yes. <laughs> a half marathon. Yes. That's Thir you know, 13 uh, weeks pregnant, right? Yeah. While we're talking about quotes, <laughs> yeah. see one of my favorite from Dr. Nedley's was and when you said it the first time, and that is that um, genetics loads the gun Yes. and lifestyle pulls the trigger. And I thought that was just mm. amazing because that's an overcoming saying is what it is. Yeah. You know? It means that I don't have to be stuck in that place, even if. Mm. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. So the program, we know that it deals with depression and anxiety. Mm. Are there other aspects of the program as well or is this, the, is this what you do? Well, no, there are other aspects. We've had people come, you know, for gastroenterology issues, uh, you know, for chronic pain in their belly every time they eat or they can't seem to gain weight or things like that. Mm -hmm. There's usually a mental health component involved, but it might be more of a physical issue um, than it is a mental issue. And if we clear up the physical issue, then the mental issue mm -hmm. can clear up. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have people that come primarily for physical issues. Uh, but the majority, since it's called the Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program, the majority are there primarily for the mental health issues. But often they don't recognize the physical issues that help bring them to that yes. point. And so we have this tendency in, in medicine to separate the brain from the body. Very true. And you know, the brain is somehow this black box that only a psychiatrist might be able to deal with or whatever. But uh, often the psychiatrist, although they might be an expert in regards to utilizing medications or a combination of medications in regards to trying to alter the brain chemistry of the brain, of course those foreign medicines can have some side effects as well, so they have to try to manage those side effects with maybe other medicines and those sorts of things. Um, it actually works best when we recognize that this is one entity and if we really help the physical, we can help um, the brain as well. And mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. this is, um, of course, very rewarding work. It's one of the most, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of enjoyable things in life uh, that I do, but I always mention the most enjoyable thing that I do is taking people from the depths of depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and helping them to lead a life that is not only free of that, but at the highest levels of emotional intelligence where they're able to manage their relationships and they're able to have very positive relationships and able to manage their emotions even on down days and even when bad things happen to them and have the proper motivation to achieve high goals and to be fulfilled in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is exciting to see yeah. people uh, like the three that we've had uh, here today yeah. doing exactly those types of things uh, where uh, it didn't seem to be possible earlier in their life. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you found your calling and your purpose. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. For sure, yeah. for sure. So before we go, just kind of, if you would, walk us through a day at the Nedley Health Solutions <laughs> Program. <laughs> they might be better at doing that. <laughs> we have a few minutes left. Tell us, like, what's a typical day like? All right. Well, let's see. This is... 0530 on your door. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't walk away until they see your face. They don't face. walk away until they see your face. Really? Wow. So there's no, okay, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, right. No, none of that. Depressed people are late night people in general. <laughs> and so if you don't get them up and you just let them get up when they want to get up, they're not going to be able to alter their brain chemistry in a positive way. Hmm. Ah. So yeah, they're up early. Or so up. getting up early is, is... Early to bed, early to rise is one of the things that helps us with negative 
negative thoughts. Big time. Really? Wow. And we change them from late night people to early morning people, not just by knocking on their door, but right after we knock on the door, what's next? 30 minutes of light therapy. We do Walking. light therapy that simulates the blue sky. So they're getting serotonin and after seven days, the body clock is reset. Mm -hmm. So now they're waking up with energy in the morning wow. and it's not drudgery and they're ready to go to sleep early at night and they're uh, and right. they have much more efficient sleep because they make more melatonin yep. at night. Yeah. I mean, I was always a morning person, but not that kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> not 5.30. So, <laughs> well, yeah, but not that way, you uh -huh. know. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. But um, I would say that, I mean, you know, um, there's not a lot of free time between 0, 0.530 and 9.30 at night or 9 o'clock at night. And that's a good thing. Uh -huh. I didn't like it at first. Uh -huh. Because I was one of the oldest guys there, uh -huh. you know, so I, I had different habits than some of the kids did, but, but, um, yeah. So it's a very uh, structured day. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's good. What you need. Yeah. 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 yeah and there was the, the tubs and the, you know, well, exercise yeah. and then breakfast. Yeah. So yeah. they exercise pretty vigorously before breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Every morning, and then so they before get, breakfast, and then breakfast, and then breakfast. Yeah, and it's a good, nutritious breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting uh, their tyrosine and their tryptophan and all of those nutrients that are going to help them make good brain chemistry, omega-3. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're loading in the brain and helping it to become more resilient mm -hmm. uh, through mm -hmm. the nutritional aspect of it. So that. giving it what it needs in order to, yes. to work optimally. And then we have our first morning session after that, uh, which is actually more on the reflective, meditative, spiritual side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the day is pretty different from one patient to yeah. another, but it, there's appointments, there's exercise, there's hydrotherapy. Yeah. The hydrotherapy sessions are normally a couple of times a day. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and then there's group sessions and there's group coaching sessions. Wow. And, uh, and uh, you know, Frank even did well with the group sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you thought so, I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, in his second week, um, he went to a homeless shelter yep. and shared his testimony. Wow. wow. And this is something Beautiful. that he doesn't like to do, getting yes. out in public and things. But I realized, you know, he was to the point where we could do this. I didn't give him much advance notice. Mm -hmm. but I said, no, no, you Frank, told me. I think you told me at 11 and we left at 11.30. <laughs> and now you're on a television program. That's right. <laughs> With as much right. advance notice. Right. You know, <laughs> so things haven't changed much in that part of the relationship. We want to thank you for being with us. This, this time went by really fast. We thank you so much for your transparency, for sharing for sharing your journey with us, and we thank you, Dr. Nedley, for all that you're doing on behalf of folks around the world. Amen. We really appreciate what you're doing. Well, to God be the glory. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And give us your website real quick. Your all website? right, uh, drnedley.com or depressionthewayout.com. Oh, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Jason. You By the way, I had to make sure I thank my co-host. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs>